Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer, with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to another edition of our special broadcasts. We have, as we discussed last week, we have a special project that we're doing alongside Fox, who's bringing you this episode, dealing with their new show, Proven Innocent. Proven Innocent's on Fridays at 9, 8 central on Fox. It's a new show that talks about wrongful convictions, and Fox has decided to allow us to have a few episodes with some special programming talking about the show and issues around the show. Uh, we've already had one episode, and this is our second. But first, I'm going to introduce that I'm Joe Patrice from Above Law, and this is Ellie Mistal from Above Law. Bonus content! Exactly. So, how are you today, Ellie? I'm wearing my pink shirt. What could be wrong? That's true. No, they, you you look sharp. I do. I feel yeah. I feel sharp. Um, but that's not what I'm angry about today. I wouldn't assume you were angry about feeling sharp. No, yeah, the, okay. the sharpness is good. Although I don't I generally want to call attention to myself when I'm out on the streets. Fair enough. Because I cannot stand the parking people. You have a problem with parking people. Yeah, so there's one of my favorite scenes in the movie Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels is when they accidentally kidnap a meter maid and then beat the living hell out of him because he's a meter maid. Mm. So my kids drop off is difficult, right? I have a working father. We have Two working parents in my household, drop-off is a difficult thing for us to do before one of us needs to go to work. So after five months at this new school, I finally gotten the kids' drop-off, the my younger son's drop-off, in such a way that I could drop him off at school, make it back to my car, make it back home, park my car, walk to the train, make my train. I had five months to actually get this completely down. Mm -hmm. And that lasted for three weeks until they changed the parking rules because some parking Nazi at the school was like, Ur, you can't park there. Why are parents always parking there? You have to park in the far lot that's like five minutes away, uphill both ways in 27 degree weather. And that really was eight minutes. That eight extra minutes that it cost me from dropping my kid off to making it back to my car is the eight minutes I needed to make my stupid train. Okay. This doesn't seem like a problem to you? No. There's absolutely no problem me parking in the closer spot. Yes, it is technically a fire lane. I'm dropping the key. Right. Yeah. I mean, that seems like a concern. I'm dro There's no fire. Yeah. There's no fire, and I'm dropping the kid off. It takes five minutes. If there was a fire, I'd move the car. I mean, you wouldn't be in the car, right? You said you were dropping them off, so you're not- a There's not going to be a five-minute, five-alarm blaze fire no, that what, I can't run it, back out and that, move the car. It's that attitude that causes That what? That, that causes, causes what? The Chicago fire? No, that's not yeah. what causes the Chicago fire. Yeah. I mean- that cow, if somebody hadn't been parked in the fire lane, that cow wouldn't have done that. All right. So, wow, that was. Meter that maids was are the devil. Ellie complaining about something. We need libertarian rules about parking. We, you should be able to park not. wherever you want. We do not. So, let's get back to talking about people who are wrongfully convicted and not, you know, just wrongfully convicted in the way that Ellie was unfairly blamed for parking. Wrongfully in an booted by car. Obviously marked fire lane. So, we have three guests with us today, and we're going to talk about a bunch of issues surrounding the the underlying tragedy, really, that is the basis of Proven Innocent. So we have Michael Semanchik. He's the managing attorney of the California Innocence Project. Good morning. Hey, everyone. Hey. We also have Jason Strong, who's a consultant to Proven Innocent. How are you out there? Good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. And finally, we have David Elliott, the show creator. Welcome to our show. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having all of us. David, let's start with you. Why create a show about this obviously very difficult and very uh, painful and important topic, you know, as opposed to, I don't know, meter mates? <laughs> well, yeah, um, I had a meter maid show. Didn't go as far as I wanted it to, and so... <laughs> this was this was my next choice. No, actually, um, I have been, I went to law school. I never practiced, but I've been sort of aware of these stories, of exoneration stories, and wrongful conviction stories for my whole adult life. And as I started writing and 
creating popular entertainment, I realized these are not only harrowing and nail biting and, and heartbreaking and terrible, uh, tragic stories are also incredibly compelling and, and, and uh, hypnotic almost in terms of, um, you know, all the things we look for as a popular writer, you know, incredibly high stakes, the highest stakes really. And um, heroic, extraordinary protagonists and cruel and unfathomable antagonists and on, on and on. And so I've kind of had my eye on this type of story. And for a long time, I spent my career, look, I was writing in feature films and uh, particularly like big summer action movie type stuff. And I was always trying to find the right one story that I thought would capture this issue and, and bring, you know, sort of shine a light on this issue. And I never was able to really settle on, you know, one, because the more I read, the more varied there were and the more of them I sort of became enamored with or fascinated with or sort of, like I said, infuriated by. And then once I started working in television a few years ago and um, started talking to Danny Strong about creating a show, writing a show, you know, for a broadcast network, I thought, well, if we could maybe tell the show and try to tell as many of these stories as we can instead of one per season, uh, let's try to at least shine a light on one per episode. Then there was a potential to finally, in my mind, capture what was so sort of varied and fascinating and compelling about all of these stories. So that was, I think, the you know sort of touchstone from where I started was that idea. I like that idea, actually, because one thing that strikes me about in the rare instance where we see wrongful conviction stories in drama, it tends to be a situation where it's presented as this long thing that makes it feel to a viewer as though it's an anomaly, that this is clearly out of left field, this one poor person who felt that who went through this problem, when in reality, we have a spate of wrongful convictions out there. And so the idea of having a bunch of them throughout the season actually helps drive home that this isn't some kind of unicorn event within the criminal justice system. Yeah, absolutely. Not. I mean, hardly unicorns, but I would add to that too. I mean, I think that's exactly right, but I would add to it as well that um, even though post-conviction relief law is esoteric and very specific sort of vein of practice and lawyers are very specialized we have to remember that they were convicted by the criminal justice system. It wasn't like they were in a different legal system to begin with. So by looking at the ways that our criminal justice system went so tragically wrong, we actually learn a huge amount about how the criminal justice system works and as importantly, if not more importantly, how it could work better. So for me, it's, it's innocence is also a, a terrific way just to talk about the criminal justice system in general, because, you know, the same, a lot of the same, processes that systematically lead to wrongful convictions are also unfair and, and inefficient when it comes to, you know, the other 10 and a half million people that are arrested every year in this country. Obviously, you're not, uh, uh, well, maybe you are, but you're most likely not speaking from personal experience with this issue. But one of our guests is, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about your story and the, the tragedy that allowed you to gain this particular expertise? Sure. Um, of course, telling my story would probably take up an entire episode of its own, but uh, <laughs> I can roughly tell you that uh, I spent 15 and a half years in prison for a murder that I did not commit. Mm. It took a great amount of effort from a large legal team from people at Northwestern, as well as two top uh, law firms in Chicago to secure my release. And it all started because one cop had it in for me. I mean, he he, uh, he wanted me to be a, a snitch for him, and I didn't know anything, told him I didn't know anything, and he threatened to make my life a living hell. And a couple weeks later, I was locked up for a murder I didn't commit, and he was the initiating officer. And, Christ. you know, that went to prison, fought my case, and got out. Has there been any, I don't know, the word is uh, justice for the officer? Like, has, has there been any no. punishment for it? No, he's just still on the force, just... Well, I believe he's uh, he's not necessarily on the force anymore. I think he actually teaches other officers, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But I could be wrong on that. Uh, but nothing nothing's ever happened to any of these uh, police officers that were involved in my case or any of the other cases that they've tainted and, and uh, ruined people's lives on. How did you get to the point where you were consulting for a TV show as opposed to traveling the country looking for revenge, which is what I think I would do? <laughs> Well, uh, 
I think David would probably uh, agree with me on this, but uh, let me know if I'm wrong, David. I've always been interested in filmmaking and movies, and I want to get out there and raise awareness and work in film. And so I, I'm trying to combine those. And he was at Northwestern talking to Karen Daniel, who's a dear friend of mine and an attorney. And the subject of me came up and she made the comment that, you know, uh, I'm into filmmaking and this and that. And she made the connection for us. And David had already heard my podcast with Jason Flom and was already interested in me. So we made connections and started talking and the rest is history. We became friends and now we're working together. Yeah, I would say that's, that's, that's right. The only thing I would add to it is that I had kind of um, made up, not necessarily made up, but it, based on a, a composite of other exoneree stories that I've read, i would sort of become fascinated with the idea of inmates who end up having this terrible uh, realization that they're kind of left alone and that their lawyers aren't going to help and their family doesn't have any way to help as their family's still even engaged. And so they, they take it upon themselves to begin learning the law and fighting their own case. And that's, and so I had this idea that that would make for the perfect protagonist for the series, Danny's idea, actually, I should say originally, but, but in building on that, that idea that somebody who learned this type of law because they had to and becoming somewhat of a jailhouse lawyer along the way, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I was very interested in that idea. And then I heard about Jason's case. I think the first time I heard of him was on Jason Flom's podcast, but also then did lots of research and was really interested to to, to learn how much of the legal work he did himself, along with the, his crack team of legal assistants, his mother and grandmother. And uh, so to me, that, that sort of epitomized what I was going for uh, with the show. So when I was in uh, meeting Karen Daniel for the first time at Northwestern, um, I saw a picture of Jason and, and I had forgotten that he was, uh, that he had been represented by uh, the Center on Wrongful Conviction, but immediately a sort of light bulb went off, and I and I told what I just told you guys to Karen, and then she said, well, he, you know, he's very interested in learning uh, film and television, and he's that's what he wants to do now that he's working, and I said, oh, fantastic, can you uh, put us in touch, please, as soon as possible? That was during, uh, while I was in Chicago filming the pilot, and so in the interim between the pilot and starting episode two, which was a few months later, uh, Jason and I became really close friends, and uh, he's you know been a huge, intricate part of the process since then. Jason and David, once you guys hooked up and once you guys started talking, can you name for me or, or think of maybe one or two changes that you made to the characterizations based on the kind of uh, real-life experiences um, that you were learning about? Well, there was a lot of things on my end. I mean, I can think of a lot of things. First of all, I was... I was really sort of heartened to realize to the extent I was kind of right that this would be a, a one-man band for a long time and really actually trying to understand, like, what legal documents did he have access to? How would that have worked? Mm-hmm. What was his relationship with the law library? When was he allowed to go to the law library? Things like that where, where it just filled in an enormous amount of what up until that point was speculation and confirmed and changed a lot of a lot of that aspect. But also in our show, our hero kind of represents – folks that I would put Jason in the category of, people that were, um, you know, this this harrowing, terrible experience actually uh, made them stronger and um, built them into a almost superhero, in my opinion. But of course, that's not the norm. That's not the, it's not everybody. It's probably not even most uh, exonerees. In fact, folks who come out of this on the other end of this are often their life has been, you know, sort of blown apart and they're very traumatized. And so to capture that element, we had, uh, I decided on having uh, my main character, Madeline Scott, convicted along with a co defendant, her brother, who were both wrongfully convicted of a murder of Madeline's best friend, their mutual close friend, when they were only 18 in high school. So the aspect of the ongoing difficulties, like even once you're out, and, and, uh, and aspects of that part of uh, the exoneree story, I didn't, I wasn't as familiar with. And Jason really helped us fill in that perspective, both me and Danny and the other writers, but also with uh, Riley Smith, who plays Levi Scott, who is the brother who's come out of prison and has not gotten his life back together and is uh, still a bit of a shambles and a mess because of it. Yeah, actually, let's that's a good place to pivot. So when we talk about these cases and like you were saying, about 15 years that's a long time to feel as though no one's able to help you. So, Michael, your work is in being kind of that group who is able to help people. So how is it that you at the Innocence Project, how do you go about finding cases, and then what do you do to offer some help here? 
Yeah, so we get about 2,000 requests for assistance a year at the California Innocence Project, uh, which is a big number. And we have to figure out which of those cases deserve additional resources, additional time. So every single case of the 2,000 that come in, all of the letters that come in, get screened. And then we, we sort of have this whittling down process And we use students, interns and clinical law students to go through all of the cases and figure out what are the ones that deserve additional attention. For those that do, that we think this one sounds like a case that could possibly have some legs, we'll assign it to a clinical law student at California Western and and we'll send them on out to investigate the case and try to come up with evidence of innocence. And really we're asking two questions. Are they innocent and can we prove it? And if we can prove that somebody is innocent and we believe it, then we'll file in court and try to get them out. Michael, can you talk a little bit about, as Joe said earlier, like this is not a one-off situation. This is not um, – it, it's not a couple of accidents, right? This is a consistent problem throughout our criminal justice system. Can you explain a little bit why that is? I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people, even amongst lawyers, really have an understanding of why so many people – end up being wrongly convicted and why there's no, you know, post-conviction review. Like, what's your sense for why this is such a huge problem? Yeah, so before I answer the why, I think I think it's important to put some numbers to it. So as of today in the United States, since 1989, there's been 2,383 exonerations in the U.S. alone. They've spent 20,945 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. So I, I think that in and of itself shows this is a a widespread and and a massive problem. And then as to the why, there's a variety of reasons. I think generally, if you take a big look, a big picture look at the system, you have to always remember that humans are involved and humans make mistakes. And then from that point, if we look at it and we say, okay, well, prosecutors are involved and sometimes you have bad prosecutors. Most of the time, I'd say they're average. Sometimes you get a good one. Defense attorneys, same thing. Sometimes you have a good one. Sometimes you have a bad one. Most are average. So there's going to be, when you have humans involved, just on the attorney side of things, you're going to have cases that fall through the cracks and people get wrongfully convicted. But I think it's more than that, too. It's what we're relying on, what we're presenting to juries that result in convictions, whether it's uh, microscopic hair comparison, which was um, you know, being done and FB- the FBI was going around the country training hair comparison experts for years. And they just recently, a few years ago, came back and said, oh, actually, sorry, uh, that's a junk science. We shouldn't have relied on that. Same similar thing with lead bullet analysis, which, again, the FBI relied on for a number of years, and and they got it wrong. It was not something that we should have been convicting and putting people in prison and even putting them on death row for. Uh, We know that of the DNA cases, more than 70% of wrongful convictions had bad eyewitness identifications. So we know witnesses are not good at making identifications of people, especially in these high-stress environments like when crimes are committed. So Everything from forensic science that can use improvement to anywhere where there's humans involved in the system, we're going to have we're going to have issues, and and our system isn't going to be perfect as long as humans are involved. Again, one would think that that would suggest that we would have post conviction review as a federal mandate, if not in all the states. Right, I definitely agree. I mean, there's not a, a currently a statute that you can request DNA testing federally, and that that's crazy to me. So your state fails you, and there's no way to request DNA testing in the federal courts. The way that the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act is set up, uh, it cuts defendants' appeal rights off shortly after their state appeal ends. We know that the average time a person that's wrongfully convicted spends in prison is over 16 years. So why are we limiting the rights of appeals in federal courts at a year, at one year? It doesn't make any sense. Again, if you're running for president on a platform of criminal justice reform, might I suggest listening to this podcast as opposed to telling me that marijuana should be legal, right? You know, I, think we're, I think we're beyond the, the pot phase of criminal justice reform. Fair enough. Well, one of the questions I wanted to go back to was just the whole concept of the brother character and how that character doesn't have their life together. And one thing that I guess this is for everybody, this question, because I think each of you have a kind of a different take to bring to it. But one thing that we've talked to other Innocence Project folks about in other states before is that one of the, the true tragic loopholes of the way the law is set up is that there are 
post-sentence services for people who get out to transition back. But when people are declared innocent, those don't apply. And so a lot of the retransitioning to to the world services that do exist out there, while they're not massive, but they do exist on some level, they don't get to help. And that has that complicates things. Is that true? Uh, I guess for Michael, I guess the question is, is that true of California? And for Jason, did you encounter any of this sort of problem when you got out? So yeah, that's definitely true for California. We actually passed a law, I think two or three years ago, it was called Obi's Law. It was based on Obi Anthony's wrongful conviction and him going to to the California Congress and basically explaining, hey, uh, when I got out, because I was innocent, I didn't get any of the parole services. And why is that? And so they passed a law called Obi's Law and that, that actually took effect uh, I think two years ago, we've since freed a number of people from prison and they still are not getting access to the same services that those that are on parole are getting. So you get out, um, it's basically, um, whoops, sorry, we made a mistake and best of luck, we hope you can make it. It's not job training. There's no halfway house. Those services should be available to them under current California law and they're just not getting them. And then on top of that, we have a compensation law in California, although many of the people that get out and get their conviction reversed are denied compensation. And that's been going on for almost two decades in California. So you'd think the least we could do is give these folks that have spent sometimes decades in prison for crimes they didn't commit is give them some money to get on their feet and give it to them quickly. And uh, that's just not happening, even with the laws on the books that you would think would help. So we definitely see that. Yeah. Jason, does this, this track with your experience? Uh, absolutely. Um, actually, my case was in uh, Illinois, and when I got out, my attorneys didn't want me to stay there for fear of retaliation from the police. So I moved oh. to Tennessee, <laughs> and uh, when I got to Tennessee, I tried to seek assistance through a reentry program to learn skills and seek job and you know and all that stuff. But um, they basically told me they didn't have anything for me or any way to help me, and I couldn't understand that. I'm like, well, why? I was in prison too, just like the rest of them, just because I'm no longer a felon doesn't mean I don't have the same needs, but they were adamant that they didn't have a way to help me. And so that's why I think it's important that, you know, we're doing the things like OB Anthony does out in California or uh, Juan Rivera and Christine Bunch do with trying to create uh, the organization that they've built, which is Justice for Just Us, to try to help, you know, our community ourselves and work within our community while we seek legislation to, you know, get it done on on a bigger scale. Another thing I'd like to add uh, if I may, just uh, on the number thing sure, that Mike yeah. was talking about earlier, I like to go with the bigger numbers of, you know, we have 2.3 million people in prisons and jails in this country, which is more per capita than any other country in the world, which is astounding. And if just 1% of that is wrong, that's 23,000 people's lives. That's a lot of people to sit in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And some people estimate it could be as high as 8 to 10%. So you're talking, you know, 180 to 230,000 people. And that's just the people in prison. That's not counting the families that are destroyed. You know, the, the fact that the real perpetrator goes on to commit other crimes in a lot of cases and how the community is impacted. I mean, there's a lot of aspects that people don't realize. Michael, what's your sense on whether the Innocence Project ever gets it wrong, right? Because I think that one of the things that I deal with when I'm out kind of talking about this, and I come, I don't want to say the party, but you can imagine which one, um, is that, well, you know, you're just just helping these people get out on technicalities. Certainly, it is a big part of the show that there are forces, mainly played by Kelsey Grammer, who really believe that that these people really did do these crimes, and that these uh, do-gooding crusader lawyers are putting criminals back on the street. Michael, do you have a sense that the Innocence Project gets these cases wrong? No, I would say definitely not. I mean, these, this is a, a situation, like I said before, where we are, we're taking the cases and we're not allowed as a member of the Innocence Network to work on a case if we think somebody actually did it. So again, our, the two things that we're looking for are, is the person innocent and can we prove it? If we don't think they're innocent, then we are not allowed to work on it to be a member in the Innocence Network. You cannot actually work in the network and represent guilty folks and try to get them out. So we have a system set up such that we won't be working on guilty folks' cases. That's a big difference that I think it's important for people to understand. 
you know, if you're a federal defender, right, if you're a federal appellate defender, like you're going to work with some guilty people. And that is still noble and important legal work. Like you, you might think in your heart that they maybe are guilty. You might think they're guilty of a different crime. But if they didn't get the proper defense, if there are your holes in their prosecution, you as a federal defender still have kind of an obligation to zealously advocate on their behalf. That is not what the Innocence Project does. The Innocence Project deals with people that their lawyers, at least, really believe are actually innocent. Right. And I should note that there are there's over 60 different innocence organizations in the Innocence Network working all over the world, just in the United States that actually use the Innocence Project as part of their name. They're all independent. I want to say there's more than 30 and they're scattered around, but they all comply with that same thing, which is that if they discover evidence of guilt, that's the end of the road. So anytime we we come up with evidence of guilt, which we have, I have, I've had cases where I've done DNA testing and it comes back and it implicates my defendant, that's the end of the road. We're done working on it. Even if I recognize that there might be constitutional claims that I could raise and, and potentially get a reversal, we can't do that because of our Innocence Network mandate. So one thing that keeps coming up, we've talked about a bunch of these kind of junk sciences, the hair size, the lead bullets, uh, problems with DNA as it's, as it's applied. So tragically, I suppose, for David, you you have a lot of options to explore throughout the course of a season of different, completely different and independent reasons why somebody might be exonerated. That's a thing that I find great about the way the show it can pivot to different stories every time, and they have wholly different reasons why people can be gotten off. Yeah, that was one of our touchstones when Danny and I started, and we started talking to the other writers, was to introduce people instead of to specific cases, because there's there are, like I said, so many compelling cases. There's more than 2,000 specifically exonerations, obviously many more than that in total. But one of the interesting things to sort of capture was the types of cases. If we could pick a case that represented not just one person, but, you know, potentially dozens of others, if not more. And so that was a really good way for us to begin to organize what what cases of the week, what episodes we wanted to focus on. And so, you know, we begin with an arson, a bad arson science case. We have a shaken baby case. We have some faulty eyewitness testimony cases and things like that. And that, that helps both for, like I said, from our perspective, for us to sort of understand the theme of the episode and what we're trying to drive at. But also, it's, uh, I think it draws attention to just how many it's, like at one point, our showrunner, Adam Arma, said, you know, we should be the anti-CSI. We should remind people that even when there's some scientific expert on the stand, uh, you know, claiming that he's 100% sure that, you know, uh, like, for example, you know, canine scent uh, <laughs> um, science is, is 100% accurate. And you're like, really? Is it? Um yeah. And, uh, you know, so we, we actually looked at it as an opportunity to tackle various different issues, including scientific um, junk science and um, overconfidence in science and things like that. Yeah, that's actually a thing that from our last podcast when we were talking with Danny, we, we got into the this show operates as something of a reversal of the trend of the last decade or so of criminal procedurals, which are almost always prosecutor and cops good. Science is always going to get the right person. Like these sorts of this trope that we're all kind of used to, this show turns a lot of that on its head. Yes, absolutely. And that was, again, one of the main motivations for me to want to create this show now, like why, why I pushed this one forward to try to see if I could do, because I think you know, people are ready across, and I don't mean this in a political statement because I actually think justice shouldn't be a political issue at all, but um, people, I think, are very much aware of a sense of looming unfairness and that the system or, you know, the establishment or whatever you want to call it is actually often the problem, not the solution. And so I thought I felt like it was very timely in that in that way. I would love the episode where Bones gets on the stand and says, oh, we can tell that he's guilty because of a pelvic bone and the just, no, you can't tell that from pelvic bones. That's not how bones work. Guys, I have a, I have a thinking like a lawyer style question to get us out of here. Um, one for each of you. David, you're going to have the longest to think about it. Michael, you're going to go first. I'm going to ask you, uh, how long will it take me to pay off my loans if I work for the Innocence Project? Jason, I need you to tell me if you got Westlaw in prison, and if not, how did you use the law books? And then, David, I need you to tell me how you go from law school to writing G.I. Joe movies um, for summer blockbusters. Michael, you first. How long till I pay off my loans if I work for the Innocence Project? 
Well, if you work for the California Innocence Project, we're based at California Western School of Law, which is a 501c3. So you make 120 payments and your loans will be forgiven, assuming that the federal government actually holds holds true to that. And so I've got uh, a little over three years to go and we'll see what happens. But 10 years, 120 payments and you're out of there. Boom. Betsy DeVos, do not screw this man. Um, Jason, <laughs> uh, do you get West Law in prison? Uh, well, so we have access to a law library. We have tons of books, but we don't have access to any computers or anything like that to uh, research oh anything current uh, or search any sites that are available there. But I utilize my mother and my grandmother to uh, do a lot of those searches for me. Oh, my God. I Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, the concept from, from my perspective as somebody who was a lawyer and did some defense work, I, I just don't even understand at this stage, how I would function if I were forced to work only off of paper. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, well, because the, it's not just because, like, I don't want to sound like newfangled, like, oh, no, I I need a computer. But it's also that the laws themselves are now written, they write these opinions in a way where they assume they're going to be searchable by computers. So it's even, the books themselves are harder to work with because everyone assumes everyone's on a computer. Yeah. That's just amazing. Uh, David, G.I. Joe, you were in law school, you graduated from law school, and then what? <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't leave my Stanford degree in order to write G.I. Joe, I will say. Um, <laughs> I, that was, a, as a lot of people know, there's a the long road to uh, hell um, paved with um, good intentions and gold, as they say. But uh, no, I actually, sincerely though, I, I went to law school thinking that I wanted to work in I guess what I would call retail politics. I was really interested in policy. I was really interested in, in tackling law school from a perspective of of justice and various issues like that, political science almost. And um, I was lucky enough to work on Barbara Boxer's first Senate campaign here in California. Yeah. And I, you know, it was kind of interesting because that was my first semester of law school. I worked for um, Boxer's campaign, and because uh, President Clinton's campaign was going so well. And uh, that we ended up essentially uh, getting all the resources from the DNC and sort of secondarily also working on the presidential campaign. And so after I helped uh, the Democrats sweep the White House and, uh, you know, both California Senate seats, I thought my work in politics was done uh, after three months. No, really, I was like I had actually just <laughs> enough access and just enough taste of that that I was, wasn't was as convinced anymore that I actually really wanted to – work in the political, the, that side of politics, the, the sort of campaign politics. And so I was at a bit of a loss and started trying to think about what else I could do that sort of satisfied the same motivation and that type of feeling. And so I learned more and more and more about policy and more about uh, how to write about policy on an in-depth level. And I started a graduate program in psychology, studying judgment and decision-making. And after all of that, I had a feeling that uh, what sort of almost a light bulb went off for me, which is that what got me interested in politics and what I cared about, why I care about all these issues in the first place, was uh, literature and movies and good television and sort of entertainment. And so I started looking at storytelling in general as a, as a way of, you know, kind of addressing the same issues that I both cared about and that I was motivated to focus on. And so that, that sort of put me on a, a sort of a side. Um, I got my first job probably shouldn't say this on tape, but I'll take a chance. Um, <laughs> my first job as, as a lawyer, I was simultaneously pitching my first screenplay, and I managed to sell my first screenplay, or at least sell the pitch of the screenplay, right about four months into my job, right around the time that I was uh, going to get a paid break to study for the California bar. And so instead of selling for the, studying for the California bar, I wrote my first screenplay, and then I basically after that uh, couldn't hit the down button fast enough on the elevator, and I went off to write what I was hoping would be important stories. And uh, turns out they don't really want to pay you a lot of money early on to write important stories. They want to pay you for, uh, you know, to learn to write romantic comedies and action movies and things that are relatively soulless. But along right. the way, I, I, I was aware that I was learning the craft. I was learning the business. I was learning how to survive and uh, hopefully thrive in the system that was Hollywood with an eye towards one day uh, writing a show exactly like Proven Innocent. And I, it, that sounds like apocryphal, but it really was the case that I, I, I thought, well, even if I end up writing things that along the way aren't satisfying the sort of motives that, that sent me to law school in the first place, it's still a very powerful medium and potentially, you know, I could reach 
tens of millions of people, if not more, uh, with these ideas. And so I've been very patiently sort of waiting for my chance to uh, to do a show kind of like this one. And so that's, I guess, the long version of the short story. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, and that show, of course, is Proven Innocent, which is Fridays at 9, 8 Central on Fox. Social media tag is at Innocent on Fox. So if you are socialing, that's where to go. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We had a, a full house here, but I thought this was a great deep dive into some of these issues underlying the show. And thank you all for listening, too. If you aren't subscribed to the show, you should be. Uh, you will get all the episodes. You should review them. You should give them stars. Thanks for listening to this special edition, a part two of three, about Proven Innocent. This episode's brought to you by Fox. For those of you who are new to the show, we also have non-special edition shows, regular edition shows going on every week as well. Uh, those brought to you by Smith AI. We will have another one of those coming up soon too, so keep on the lookout for that. Read Above the Law, obviously follow at L-E-N-Y-C, follow at Joseph Patrice on Twitter. And with all of that, I think we're done, and we'll talk to you all later. Presidential candidates, get at our level! Okay, cool. Bye. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.